Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 10. Coming up on this show, we've got Nature and Nurture versus the Species Field, the new American Surveillance State, and Parrot Disaster Early Warning Systems. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. <laughs> is the new... <laughs> What is that? Like, <laughs> is that a parrot going like, what? asteroid, asteroid? No, not quite. I mean, you're on the path there. I suppose if an asteroid was heading towards you, that that would, would assist you in that circumstance. But no, this actually relates back to uh, the work of Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who is a, a truly you know fascinating individual. And we know his work quite well. One of the books that he's published that we've covered many years ago is, uh, I believe it was called Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Uh, it was fully updated and revised back in 2015, I believe. Are any of the dogs from the original book still alive today? Oh, that's Can really... we do a where are they now? Oh, you know what? I was all I was actually quite <laughs> sad because I saw on his website. So if you go to sheldrake.org, but of course I'll link to that in the show notes so you can check it out for yourself. Uh, there's this section, right, on end of life experiences. And of course, like end of life experiences, you know, we, we are familiar with this sort of stuff. Mm. But no, for animals, right? And he's got a, an article about animals that experience terminal lucidity. And if you recall, terminal lucidity is when, you know, someone is, uh, is extremely, um, I guess, disabled or suffering from dementia and, you know, they're just not the same person anymore. And right before the moment of death, within hours, they seemingly completely recover and be their old normal selves again. Yeah, right. So they could say goodbye. So that happens in animals It too. happens with dogs. And so I was reading through the paper that Sheldrake had published. I'm like, I can't read this on the show. It's like, it's full of doggo stories. Like if you're Why like- can't you do that on the show? Oh, because it's so sad. It's a story. Oh, please. It's story after story of people that have had their dogs for 15, 20 years. And then the dog, they can't bear to take it to the vet, you know, to, to take it, to end its you life. People and your animals. Oh, and it's just like, it's Come on. so sad. So, so let, let me get this straight. You can do a thousand episodes on people dying, people on their deathbed, but you can't do one about a dog. People are garbage. You know I'm right. You know I'm right. I don't think that at all. These dogs. I think dogs are garbage. No, they, they eat their own feces. Well, not all. So do some people. Oh, but they're so adorable. They are. They are. And you know, and that whole argument as well of people like, if you're not a parent, you don't understand. Well, I'm a parent now as well as a dog owner, and I can tell you, it's incredible. You can't. In all seriousness, though, it's like it is really sad. Like people do get attached to their dogs, and so these are just story after story of people going. Oh, the dog suddenly came back to being normal and then came and said goodbye to all of us and then died in the front yard. And I'm like, I can't do this on the show. Wow. <laughs> the emotional heartstrings. Oh, I just can't. Although, speaking of being a parent, uh, I had a really remarkably uncanny experience this week with my with my oldest son. And that's what is going to be uh, kind of kicking off the theme of this show that ties in with the morphic fields and, and resonance and this kind of stuff. Um, it's it's a really strange kind of coincidence that it just so happens that Rupert Sheldrake, who has his own uh, YouTube channel, he put up a, a post this week, uh, just four days ago, talking about presentiment. Presentiment is this thing which, you know, it seems that there seem, it must be some type of uh, hidden ability that people have to pick up on events that are about to take place, things that are about to occur. Uh, Dean Radin has explored this in great depth. In fact, Ben, if you bring up image number one for me, I can show you this great study that you're probably familiar with. Is that the one you're thinking of? I've got that. That's the one. Yeah, just bring that up. So if you look at this study, right? So what he did is he got a bunch of people and participants uh, and put them into a scientific study environment, a controlled environment. And uh, that top crop image in the graph there, that's uh, emotional images. So what they did, they sat people down in front of computers and they showed them images. And it was a flowers and puppies and all wonderful things. And every now and again, there would be a hardcore porn image that would mm -hmm. pop up. And so if you're looking at this graph at the moment, but even if you're not, it's on time, right? So what this... Uh, so the x-axis is samples per five second and the y is the change in electrodermal activity, the brain activity. Not brain activity, your skin activity. Sure. So it's basically like... Oh, so the sweat response. The sweat response, right. which apparently is, is highly reliable. And it's pretty much like um, a lie detector test, even though lie detector tests aren't admissible, but apparently it's quite sensitive. And so as you can see in this image here, it's, it's split up into three separate areas. You've got before the image is shown, during the image being seen, and after the image being seen. Now, of course, uh, after the image being seen, that would make sense that it's quite high, like your emotive reaction is quite high, and then it tapers mm -hmm. off because you've just seen this emotive image, regardless of what it is, and it's caused you to have a skin reaction. But what was really strange in this study is that you can see that in the before section, before the image even comes up, in comparison to calm images, so there's a bunch of puppies and flowers, you get no response. 
But before you're shown a provocative image, you actually have a response. Yeah, so it's... It's it, like your body knows. We, it, it wasn't Sheldrake that started this kind of experiment. This is Dean well, Radin. Oh, sorry, this yeah, Radin. Radin. Yeah, yeah. With and this the, is the argument that it's uh, presentiment and you're actually perceiving, your body is responding to the image before you actually see it. That's it right. It shows there's some kind of uh, presentiment. There's, there's a psychic response. Yeah, there's something going on in some way and it's really strange because it drops down during and then it skyrockets back up afterwards. And so we really can't explain what's going on here. And of course, people like Dean Radin and Rupert Sheldrake you know, suggest that there is some um, force field energy, something like that, which isn't recognized by modern science, which has been able to pick up on exactly what's Mm. going on here. Of course, Rupert Sheldrake himself has uh, any number of of fascinating uh, explorations as to what this could be and morphic fields plays into this part, like where memory sits. And of course, Rupert Sheldrake is a person who certainly doesn't believe in the concept of the brain being the generator of consciousness, but rather being the receiver. Of, of consciousness. And that's possibly why people are having these experiences like this example is because somehow they're picking it up from a field somewhere, this, this morphic field, uh, this all of history, all of knowledge, everything else is contained within these fields that we don't recognize. And indeed him himself, if you bring up image two there, Ben, this is a study that he participated in himself where he was subjected to something very similar. And Sheldrake points out that he's like, if you can see on, it's very similar scale here where he's shown the image right in the center there, almost he's shown the image. And um, he talks about uh, violent images. So he was actually shown calm images, which is the blue line, which is just completely normal as you'd expect. He Mm. was shown uh, violent images, which strangely enough seem to follow the line of calm images. But he says, I'm a biologist. I've done dissections. I've, you know, dealt with some pretty gruesome things that didn't emote a response in him. However, when he was shown erotic images, pornography, it did exactly the same thing as in the Dean Radin experiment. He actually had a, uh, a response to it before he saw the image. And again, it's important here because he doesn't know when the image is going to pop up. It's completely randomized. And yet every single time, as shown by this graph, uh, graph, he had a response Mm. before the image was seen. Like you never know when a horrific image might suddenly show up (laughs) on the screen. Could happen at any moment. Some kind of horrific... I I knew something was coming because I could see you typing over there. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. Can we zoom out? (laughs) Oh, don't worry, everyone. It's just a, it's a loaf of banana bread. Don't worry. So what we're going to be going into on this show is not banana bread. Uh, that would be a good idea for a study, though. Like, you get images that you think smart. are, you know, something Provocative. horribly uh, pornographic, but it's really just an old roast beef sandwich. <laughs> and then you detect the galvanic response. Because that would prove whether, it, like, the body knows that it's not a real pornographic image. It is just some kind of horrible banana bread, close up of well, a banana that, bread. You raise a good point there because it seems to be that it's not even the image. It's actually our reaction to that image, which seems to be what we're, the pre So you probably is. still would you get would still a reaction. get a that. reaction. Yeah, there'd be some type of response that would kick. So I wonder how many people were just feeling slightly anxious. A no, little bit well, off. no one. No, no, <laughs> before you put that image up. Because it just spiked right before it came up. And then as soon as everyone sees that, it's horrifying. So that's what we're going to be going into. Uh, but before we do that, what have you got coming up on the Plus Show? Oh, I found this fantastic new work. It came out in late February. It's by Byron Tao, who is an investigative journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. Can you bring it up on the, the page here? Didn't yeah, it's a means of control, how the hidden alliance of tech and government is creating a new American surveillance state. Oh, that's uncomfortable. And with the the mention of TikTok being in the news and uh, the potential forced divestment from the the Chinese stakeholders in the company or even the banning of the app, which I don't think is going to happen. But it's interesting to talk about this new surveillance state that he's discussing. And Tao has spent five years uncovering this. And of course, we know about Prism, for example, from Snowden. Snowden yeah. came out in 2013 exposing the NSA's uh, vast collection of data on American citizens and other people around the world. Yeah. They're checking your phone calls like a crazy ex-girlfriend. Yeah, that's Constantly. well, the way they would do it is they would, uh, you know, sabotage networks. They had backdoors into software. They were able to hoover up vast amounts of data, almost like tap- the old tapping into the phone lines idea. No one cares. No one did anything about it. No one cared. Everyone just signs away on the terms and conditions. Well, and go, oh, whatever. That might be true for the average consumer. You know, they'll think, how does that affect me? But there were great changes in the tech industry that followed. That's good. Like uh, the encryption 
as a feature became a huge thing. You saw Apple, for example, rolling out encryption in uh, iMessages and other apps followed. They Encryption became a, a feature for these applications and it became more difficult for the NSA and other agencies to use those older methods of gathering data for intelligence. Mm. Now, what Tau has uncovered is an entirely separate network to what Snowden described in those initial 2013 and 2014 data dumps. Another one. There's an entirely separate system. And this is perhaps more dangerous, more powerful than anything we've ever seen before. Oh, my God. And for example, like one example I'll discuss coming up in the Plus extension is with this new system, they can locate where Vladimir Putin is, for example, at any time they want. A precise location. How? And you might think in the past, well, how would you know where the leader of a state is? Well, you would. You might think, okay, well, they've got satellites or they've got some kind of advanced spy plane or... Yeah, you, you might think, think satellite imagery with like really sophisticated camera technology. It, or it's something more exciting, like they've got a double agent that's, you know, close to Putin's inner circle. You might think something like that. No. Is this him checking Twitter, is it? This weapon, you're on the right track. Obviously, it's got to do with, with apps and data, but this weapon can identify... Yeah, anyone within his entourage, and that basically tells you where Putin is, mm. to the point where, uh, like, there's an example I'll share later where a nuclear um, submarine commander, a Russian nuclear submarine commander, was assassinated using this weapon. Oh, didn't they only recently kill, who was the the head of some terrorist group? It was uh, right at the end of Trump's pre- presidency. And I'm wondering, is, it, is did they use the same type of technology for that? What was his name? I oh, can't. it's Ben something or... Oh. Grundy? No, it wasn't Ben Grundy. <laughs> it's presentiment. No, no, no. It was. I can't remember the name. His name. Um. But yeah, I mean, that was a that was a big issue. Yeah, this will blow you away because he goes through the history, and obviously, DARPA is involved. The CIA yes, funding are. is involved. But ultimately, how this system works, how this surveillance <laughs> system functions, it is. It's totally out in the open, but. Th- they, the intelligence agencies don't want you to know about it. That's so hiding in plain sight. Big tech doesn't want you to know about it. And certainly uh, the CCP and, and other foreign adversaries don't want you to know about it. So, but hang on, but you would think that an enemy state would want to expose something like, are they using their own version? It's because they're all using oh, they're it. They're all in on it. They're all using yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like this, this modern world we're in, where we're seeing like they're trying to push these wars and all this stuff. I'm sorry, at some level, they're all in on it. It's the elites or whoever they are against the rest of us. That's exactly what is going it's on. It's not even states. like the opening chapter is is pretty interesting. It's it's the moment that the U.S. government realized it had a grinder problem. You know the app grinder, yeah. and it, it basically goes from there. <laughs> so you like, mean what a bunch of senators were using grinder or something? Uh, many in the U.S. government were are on grinder, and who owns grinder? Who controls grinder, Aaron? Uh, well, Take a wild guess. <laughs> is it uh, Israel or China? <laughs> I like how, I'm not trying to be I like how, I'm just genuinely questioning. I like how hesitant you are to say <laughs> Israel. He's like, oh boy. Whoa. I, I don't want to get involved with that. I'm not going there. It's <laughs> like so you'll happily oh, say China. It's <laughs> like so you'll say China in two seconds. Like, yeah, CCP. China. But the other one, you're like, oh, no, I don't know if I wanted to mention it. But, Ben, it's am China. I right? It's the CCP. Oh, okay. <laughs> the CCP. It's a it's Chinese control. Is it really? The CCP controls Grindr. Wow. And so, obviously, it was a bit of a worry that so many within the US government were using Grindr. And I'll get into you know, how this expands out into this I this thought it was just topic. used by James O'Keefe to get bad dates. Like, I didn't realize. <laughs> well, isn't that a, an interesting indicator that so many of those uh, expositions from the old Project Veritas, they were... Like gay dates. They were gay dates. Yep. So because of a lot of the time, stereotypes be damned, gay men are bitches and they love to go and and bitch and carry on and show off about how powerful they are. That's been well understood in intelligence circles for a long time. Really? It's always been said, you know, be careful having uh, gays and and lesbians in the (laughs) intelligence services because, well, it's quite obvious when you think about it, it's a leverage point. Yeah, that's exactly as, as, right. Especially yeah, yeah. if they're not they're out, if yep. they're closeted, that's a huge leverage point and your adversaries will use that. Wasn't 
Wasn't there, I mean, this is back in the 90s, but I think there was a Republican senator, and it's, there's that old joke that it's always Republican senators, right? But there was a Republican senator that was closeted and obviously had a full-on family and everything, but at the same time was screwing around with men in the background. But it was like, it was somehow manipulated by the Chinese. Oh, I, I don't know. I can't, I've got to look it up. They held, It was either the Chinese or some adversary, but they basically blackmailed him. Some kind of adversary. No. <laughs> that's not fair. That is not fair <laughs> at all. So that's coming up in plot. Okay, fantastic. I'm looking forward to getting into that. Well, then let's just jump into the show. And so this is a weird thing. I think we've all experienced this at, at some level, right? And a few of the things that we talk about on the show will actually become probably a little bit clearer. Uh, the first one is... Uh, why is it that when we have some type of significant scientific discovery, like the development of a new technology or some type of you know, uh, groundbreaking breakthrough, that it seems like while it's being discovered in one part of the world, the same discovery pops up in a completely unconnected way at another lab somewhere else? Like It's like everyone seems to know at the same time, like these discoveries all happen at the same time. And that's true of all, all the major discoveries in history yes. where you look at the whether it's you know Isaac Newton or... Uh, like the, a sudden the, understanding. The, the guy that invented television or whatever it is, the integrated circuit or whatever, whatever yep. it is, there's one guy in the history books who was the first, but yep. you look into it and there was like 10 other people in different parts of the world that were just on the cusp of finding it out as well, yep. or making the discovery At as well. At the same time, the answer may lie in morphic fields, mm. species morphic fields. And so if you're not aware of what a morphic field is, a morphic field is this, and it sounds very... Um, ephemeral, and, and in, in a sense that it is, right? Because it's obviously not recognized by mainstream conventional science. But when you're talking about someone like Rupert Sheldrake, who is you know, in himself a scientist, uh, but he seemingly, from some of the stuff that I've read and listened to from him over the years, was kind of disillusioned with m mainstream materialist science or Western science very early on in his career. I mean, the, come on, the guy was doing lectures with, I think, Terence McKenna back in the 90s. So, you know, he's already on the fringe anyway. Uh, but with leading, you know, uh, institutions, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, all these sort of locations that he's dealt with. And, but he looks, he's, he's a revolutionary in the sense that he really does think outside the box. And I think that obviously that's very healthy, especially in this scientific field. Um, but what he quickly realized is that there is some type of force which explains why certain things happen the way they happen. And basically it comes down to these two warring elements in the universe. It's this interaction between um, things that are repeatable, habit, habitual events, and creativity. And this could explain things like why twins, like there's, and I'll go into some of these stories of why twins that are separated at birth, but they're, you know, they're twins that are of the same egg. And they'll go through life and they'll have like the same name of their wife and they'll name their kids the same and you know, do these strange like oh, twins that have been separated. Yeah. They discover that. And, yeah. then, and it's like really, it's like why? And of course, the answer in the past has been, well, there must be some genetic reason for it. There must be some type of reason because genetics obviously is the, the golden standard. It controls everything. Um, but even he points out in one of his lectures, which I'll link to, that you know, back in the 70s, if you discussed epigenetics, like the idea of genes turning on other genes and that kind of stuff, that was Freaky, heresy. Outrageous. Outrageous. Like, it's heresy to describe that. Um, but what he's describing is even beyond that, even though epigenetic, epigenetics is becoming more readily accepted these days. But it plays into some more of the more unusual things, the supernatural things that we describe, telepathy, uh, and obviously dogs that know when their owners are coming home, these unseen communications, connections between people that all have some type of medium, and that medium must be these, seemingly, seems to be these fields. So this experience, uh, it also relates to, it's strange because there's like layers of it. So you can have a species field. So you can have a species that one, like a group of like uh, rats, for example, will learn something. And then it's seemingly after that, rats all around the world in labs will learn exactly the same thing without having any exposure to it whatsoever. Wasn't the old example of this called the hundredth monkey effect where uh, the monkeys on the island learnt to do a particular thing yeah. with a tool and then all the other monkeys but, figured it out? I don't think Sheldrake has ever mentioned that. That stuff has come. I could be wrong, but I don't recall him being... I have heard that before, but I don't think he really goes in. This is a little bit more complex than that. It seems to be that this has been scientifically observed in many locations. Um, which suggests that there is some type of field. But then you can have, if you've got a problem right in your family, and you're like, why does my family keep behaving this way? And we're like, we've all got the black sheep in our family. We've always got something going on. It actually could be to do with your family morphic field of things that have happened in the past, which are formed by habit, which repeat in the future as well and happen around you, which I'll go into in a moment. But what happened for me is that my family has had this long history, which I've not always been comfortable with, of having some type of um, weird, you know, 
pre-sentiment, if you can call it that. Uh, we used to call it Woodja. That was like, you know, mm. when someone was going to call, you know, you'd think about someone or something would happen. Uh, you knew when something bad had happened. And um, I'd always put it outside and very much followed the hardcore, you know, line of science, which is a foolish thing to do, a very fool's errand. And I've come around from it now. Um, but my son, my oldest son, who's five years old now, is totally just, psychic. He, well, not psychic, but he's <laughs> just displaying all these strange attributes that are that are consistent with that, with like what other family members have. And I'm just like, what on earth is going on here? And a great example was for breakfast the other morning. He just yelled out my password to my computer, and I'm what? like, how? He just yelled it out. How long is your password? Long, right? So I is it uh, a bunch of words? It's that... words. Yeah. So it was, sorry, it wasn't for my computer. It so was like my a phone. Fra- it's like a phrase. Yeah, it was a phrase, right? And I use it for my phone because I'm paranoid about it, so... it. Does it start with a capital? Yeah. Has it got any numbers in it? Yeah, all that. Oh, give us an idea of yep. what the. So it's like uh, twelve characters long at least, and he yelled out at least the, the, it was like a term. He yelled out the term at breakfast, and I'm like, and it's a, it's a term. <laughs> How? How? It's a term that you would never use. It's it's gibberish, really, and he just yells it out. Right? Is it like a racial epithet that you usually scream out at that in the house, and <laughs> no. he just picked it up from that? No, I've never I've never <laughs> said these words. These are words that I have have never said, right? And so I turned to him and I looked at him because I was quite shocked because you know what I was doing? I was trying to log into my phone, and because it's so long, I was like, I keep on like stuffing it up, and I was like, oh, and I was frustrated, and oh, he just yelled it out. So he picked it out of your head without look. He was on the other side of the room, <laughs> and this kid picked it out. Right? I said, where did the, what are you doing? Where did that come from? And his response was, I don't know. It's just like this blatant, I don't know, right? And there's been other things, like things that have happened over the years, but he's getting older now, so this stuff is starting to come through. And all of it, you know, is, is kind of uh, irrelevant, except for the fact that um, on the weekend, I had this really uncanny experience in that uh, months ago, months and months and months ago, I had this really strange dream that he was uh, pricked by a needle at school. And I thought, you know, and obviously that's a terrifying aspect to think, you know, that something like that could happen. Um, but, and I thought, well, maybe it's because the area that we live in, we live in a nice part of town, except for the fact that, um, you know, there is with Australia's cost of living crisis and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of homeless people that have moved in down at this kind of Creek and the neighbors were recently talking about seeing syringes down there. You have a hobo Creek near your house? Yeah. Right down from us. Yeah. And it's just, Gross. it's just full of druggies, you know? And so I thought maybe that's been on my mind and we don't go there anymore. Like we, we used to go there because there was like playground equipment, but we don't go there anymore. And, um, that's what I thought the dream was. I was like, oh, it must be that. I've somehow incorporated this into my head until on the weekend, last Saturday afternoon, my son starts telling me about how he was at school uh, and this kid stood on a needle. And I'm just like, oh, wow. I'm like, what? Like, what the hell's going on? And he hasn't told me anything about this. I'm like, no, no, tell me. And because he's a five year old and he's confused, right? He's like, oh, you know, what happened at the bikes? And I'm just like, oh, my God, like, what's this school doing? So here I was like, ready to. Like go and get him checked, and then have to call the school. If I was, it happens that this poor kid stepped on it somewhere else. Like, but it was just he was telling him about it at the at the bikes. But I'm like, that's strange. Like the fact that that it was like, did I pick up on the emotion of my son telling me about this, and then me reacting to it? Was that somehow in a dream? What's the time difference between the event and the dream? Months, months, months mm. that I had this, but it was so it was such a strong dream that that's, it stayed with me. That's why whenever we've covered the topic of presentiment and getting this future information from dreams, the advocates of it have always said, you've got to have a dream diary. Yes, Especially when we've covered stories of people that have uh, cultivated this ability where they can gather this information from dreams, sometimes useful information from the future. They often say that they never would have made the match if they didn't have the dream diary because often the presentiment and but the distance between the presentiment and the actual event can sometimes be years. Yes. For yep. like a small thing. Yep. Like what you're saying, well, obviously, it's, it's a dangerous situation, but yep. it's a small thing. It's a small thing. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't exactly the way I saw it either, right? So I'd had this dream where it was him, it was my son, but it wasn't. It was some mm. other poor kid. You know, and he's fine, by the way, which is really good, but it's like a, still a horrible thing to, to occur. Um, but the odd thing was is that Rupert Sheldrake this week, in his video on presentiment, he put up something very similar. So he describes a book, and we know this book. It's by J.W. Dunn, and it's it's a uh, experiment with time. He was this uh, former British aeronautical engineer. He was deployed to South Africa with the army. And when he was down in South Africa with the army, he started having these strange dreams where he noticed the following day, so it was quite rapid. The following day, he was able to um, get this deja vu experience. It was like, I did I dream that? You know? And he started to think that he was having some type of um, kind of weird false memory syndrome. That he was like, oh, I saw this, but I, I thought I dreamt it, but I'm obviously... And he realized that that's not the case. Like this, these all can't be false memories. And it happened more and more often. 
So what he started to do was keep a dream journal. So he was one of the earliest proponents of this, mm. of keeping this dream journal. And in doing so, he started to very rapidly realize that he was having precognitive, presentient dreams that were showing him the reality, the nature of reality around him. So Rupert Sheldrake uh, points out, and he'll say this, is that um, you probably won't believe him unless you do it for yourself. So we did. Take a listen to what Rupert did when he started uh, reporting this. Oh, you got a bunch of videos for me. I Let's do. Let's go. How many? 10 hundred. That's not, that's not a number. Number one? Yeah, number one, please. In his book, he tells you that you won't believe him unless you try it yourself. And so I tried it myself, writing my dreams down. And sure enough, I soon experienced things that um, hadn't yet happened. In one dream, for example, I dreamt that I was in a room with a number of friends and there was somebody who came into the room with a needle and was going around the room trying to inject people. Um, and I found it very sinister and it was a disturbing dream. Um, and uh, I interpreted it as trying to inject people with heroin or something like that. Um, two or three days later, I was at a friend's birthday party in South London. And what was happening was that suddenly, in the middle of the party, someone came in with an ear-piercing device, which had a shiny needle on it, and went round the room offering to pierce people's ears. Well, I hadn't dreamt exactly about an ear-piercing device, but as John Dunn says, what you do is write down the visual impressions, and the visual impression was one of somebody coming in with a needle trying to pierce people. And that's what happened. There it is. Isn't it incredible, though? I mean, even someone like Rupert Sheldrake, who, even though he's talking about, you know, he's involved in this kind of stuff, he's having these sorts of experiences. Like, he wasn't necessarily a believer, but he's writing it down. And then days later, he has this experience. And again, like, he points out there that it's about the impression. So even though the dream wasn't exactly what took place, the core elements of that are exactly the same. And I wonder if it's the same kind of thing. Is it that his dream was pre-sentiment of the shock that he would have of seeing the needle? Or was it pre-sentiment of the shock that he would have of going, oh my God, I've just dreamed this? And it seems like it's one of those atrophied abilities that we all have. And by starting the dream journal, yes, you might it might, might be like working a muscle. You're totally right. Because you're you're applying thought and energy to that ability. Yep, I think you're... It you're, probably emerges after you start taking the diary. And I've tried doing it over the years. Like I, I get a dream journal and I start, I'm going to do this. This is going to be awesome. And then I get about four nights in and then just, I just stop, stop caring. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just stop caring what my dreams are about. They're never that interesting. Or they're really embarrassing and I don't want anyone to find to the diary after I've You've died. You've seen this before. What's going on in Yeah, that was because that, 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 la- that was the last time I started one. I, I, that was the last dream Did I wrote Did your wife down. read it? Was that no, the one no one read, read it. I torched it. It was, <laughs> I don't want anyone to ever find that. It was just the grossest dream ever. I don't want anyone to know about it. I don't want to talk about it. And... I don't want to mention it again. So I, that's the last time I ever did a dream journal. <laughs> oh, well, okay. We'll skip over that one. Um, but basically, Sheldrake uses this as a as a jumping point to describe some of his theories about what is occurring here, this pre-sentiment, if it's some type of uh, access to information, which is always present, but we just, and like you rightly pointed out, Ben, that we've atrophied in our ability to access it. Um, but some people spontaneously do, but other people can train these abilities. But even do it in an unwitting way. And a really great example is that he did a study into people that um, wake up be- right before their alarm goes off. And this is apparently very common. Dude, I do that all the time. Do you really? Every Because I never set an alarm. I just wake up when I wake up. Yep. But when I do need to set an alarm, yep. I never wake up to the alarm. It's always, without fail, five to ten minutes before the alarm really? goes off. Really? And it's so annoying. <laughs> well, it is annoying. Oh, yes. But Sheldrake has done studies into this. He's done online surveys, you know, which is not entirely scientific, but it's just trying to get a feel for what's going on. And he says, like, the last time he did one of these, asking people these questions, it was like 80% of the time people have had the, or 80% of the participants have had this yeah. experience. So it must be so common. I've never had it. You never had I've that? I've never had that. I've never woken <laughs> up before an alarm. I've slept through a whole heap of alarms, but I've ne- never woken up Yeah, you do alarm. sleep through a lot of alarms. I do. I, I can have alarms going <laughs> yep. off. Okay, I'll meet you at the office 9 a.m. Yep, I'll be there. No worries. Hey, I was jet lagged. Get to 11 a.m. I had a gut full of egg slut and I was jet lagged, all right? <laughs> like, come on. So 
with these experiences, though, he asks the next question is because you can go, well, look, this is routine. And there's this the idea which is put forward is that we've got this internal biological clock, which yeah, I, you know, I believe. I, that's what I think it is. No, he's like, it's not that at all. It's not, and it's what's really fascinating about that is in, in the actual studies that have been conducted, and it's difficult to conduct these studies because, you know, first of all, um, th- th- that's kind of like almost like the control. The second layer of this is that well, uh, he's tested people that have gone to locations where it's an unusual alarm. So whether in like a completely different location, they're on holidays and they've got to get up for a flight or something like that. Um, these are times that are randomized, mm. you know, and but and yet people still like sixty something percent of the time will wake up before that alarm. Like they said it at a certain point. Oh yeah, I'm the same. You're the same. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. It doesn't matter if the alarm's at 8 a.m., 5 a.m. If I have a nap in the afternoon, I want to wake up. Isn't that weird? I've had a really like late night and I want to have a nap in the afternoon. I had to always wake up before the alarm. I mean, obviously you've worked with me for a long time, but have you ever worked shift work or anything like that? No. no interesting. Okay, because some people describe that when they've had shift work that that seems to be more common for some it's reason. It's the lamest supernormal ability ever. Oh, it really is. But it becomes more intriguing in when you start looking at to what could be behind it because we do provide all these, you know, faux scientific answers. Oh, it's the internal body clock. Oh, it's routine. Oh, it's like it's like cows, for example, right? <laughs> Apparently cows, we saw that in a farm a couple of weeks ago. Apparently cows know what time it is. I'm like, oh, come on. Like, come on. And like, this, <laughs> Why would they care? This farmer, no, this farmer I was talking, it's for when they're being fed, right? Oh, and she, this farmer, she's like, look, um, we normally feed them at exactly the same time, but because it was a hobby farm and, you know, people come out, she's like, sometimes we have extra families that come out, they can't come out at certain times, so they come out later or come out earlier. And so on these weekends, we'll feed the cows at different times. And the cows are everywhere. They've got this massive amount of land and the cows are everywhere, sprawl all over this place. But for whatever reason, the cows will show up like 10 minutes before the people will show up. None of this sounds that amazing to me because life is rhythm. Everything is rhythm. The universe runs in rhythm. Well, these rhythms. are random times. They, so it's when people show up at random times because they've been delayed, whether they've got other things like kids' soccer or okay, whatever. I'm an idiot. I should have listened to what you were saying. Then that, the is, cows, that is interesting. Isn't it weird, right? It's it's really weird. And this is just an anecdote from a farmer telling me this. But this ties into the Sheldrake stuff because Sheldrake points out, he says, look, um, what happens is, is that people are, are notoriously bad at consciously knowing what time it is. Like if you, some people are okay, but the reality is if you distract someone mm. and, and ask them what time it is, that often will not know what time it is. They will be able to get maybe within the hour, to, but they can't get right down to the moment. And this is what's happening with these dreams. It's like people are getting down, well, not dreams, I'm sorry, but this awakening for the alarm clock. They're getting down to this very pre- precise time. So he says that this also happens with uh, unexpected alarms. So fire alarms and um, you know planes going overhead and all this kind of stuff, earthquakes occurring, they seem to know. Take this story of a fireman who described what happened to him to Sheldrake. The best way to test... Uh, whether or not waking before alarms is a presentiment uh, effect or whether it's a biological clock effect, is to look at unexpected alarms. And I've been doing surveys of people uh, asking whether they've woken before unexpected alarms, like the phone going off or um, like a fire alarm or like some other alarm uh, that's um, going to wake them up. And many people have. Between 66 and 80% of my respondents say that they have woken before unexpected alarms. And one of the most interesting stories among the stories I've collected came from a fireman in the United States who said that he and his colleagues slept at the fire station waiting for alarms. Um, And he got to the point where uh, he would just wake a minute or two before an alarm went off. And he'd already sat up in, uh, uh, from his bed where he was sleeping and got his boots on when the alarm went off. And those were quite unpredictable alarms. That's a good idea. The fireman's a good example. It's the ultimate randomised study because they have. there's no way that his biological clock can know when a fire is going to start and the alarm is going to be called in. There's just no way. So... It's like, what's occurring here? And that's a useful ability because he can get up and get ready. That's what he does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Before the alarm goes yeah, off. Yeah, he's like, he's wide awake. And this is the thing. I mean, for me, maybe it's because of the way I, say, I find it hard to wake up. But in some of these cases, like it's not like you wake up and you're kind of like, oh, a little bit groggy. And you, No, people just are wide awake. They're wide awake and they know that it's, oh, well, an alarm is about to occur. And it's really strange. Now, yeah, maybe it is just this lame supernormal ability which, which sits out there. Um, but for some people, it can be quite advantageous. But the thing is, if you don't have this ability, if it has atrophied so much, you don't have these experiences, the answer may lie in the animals 
that are around you. And of course, this forms part of what Sheldrake's work is, like with dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And in that particular book and in those studies, what really stood out, very much like the cows, was that owners would come home at random times. Yes, of course, owners would always come home at regular times. That's how the dog would possibly work out that it was the time to come home. But a lot of the times it would be if you left work early, if you got caught in traffic, if the subway was delayed, things like that. The animal would only act up right before you came home. There was no rhythm or regularity to it. So it suggests that this biological clock or the dog being extremely smart, that's not the answer to what's going on. There is something supernormal that's occurring. Yeah, it's not them hearing the car coming or the Nothing jingle like of that. the keys or the footsteps no, or anything. Yeah. No, it's it's something else. So Sheldrake highlights a couple of experiments that have been conducted. Uh, one is about uh, rats that were seen throughout uh, Italy right before a major earthquake. Just uh, have a listen to this one. In the 1997 Assisi earthquake in Italy, uh, I had had at the time an Italian research assistant, and within two days she was in Assisi uh, interviewing people like the mayor and um, newspaper reporters, restaurant proprietors, zookeepers, vets, um, uh, and other people about unusual animal behavior. Several days before the CC earthquake, rats came out of their holes and were swarming over terraces of restaurants, um, causing uh, alarm among people eating there. The restaurant proprietors complained to the mayor about this. No one knew why it had happened. Um, and then the earthquake struck. Unusual howling of dogs in the night for a night or two before this happened, uh, and other examples of unusual animal behavior. In the 1970s, the Chinese, under Chairman Mao, had a project for earthquake warnings by asking peasants and workers to report unusual animal behavior. And as a result of it, uh, they were able to excavate, uh, sorry, um, evacuate entire cities before uh, devastating earthquakes struck. These animal warning, warning system, together with other traditional folklore type uh, wisdom about what might happen, changes in wells, unusual behavior in springs, and so on, uh, together gave earthquake warnings, whereas modern seismologists with all their fancy apparatus can't do this. Yeah, the most fascinating thing about that is the time before the actual event. Yes. You know, we've heard these stories a lot over the years, and you can sense you can get the idea that animals would detect perhaps vibrations subtle, in the earth. Yeah. There's some kind of subtle movement or sound that we can't detect. But you wouldn't think it would be days before. No. Days uh, before. Days before. And that's why I included that part of the audio as well, though, about how the Chinese were, were looking at this as well, because there's like that folklore. And I know, obviously, with the communists that they cleared out, you know, all types of traditional culture and all that kind of stuff. But some of it, some of the folklore is obviously there amongst the peasants. And he, and he highlights there, it's like, it's not just the way that the animals behave. It's like a change in a wellspring. Mm. Like there's these old, it's like almost, again, it's like the ultimate science in the sense that it's observation. It's like people have been observing for a very long time things that occur and the results that happen from those occurrences. And it's like you tie it all together and you actually do have a far more sophisticated, in a strange way, system of detecting earthquakes than we do with, with what we have with modern and seismology. So this is the parrot early warning system that well, the, you are envisioning. It is. It is the parrot one. I'll come back to the parrots in a moment because these sorts of studies have been out there for a long time. In fact, uh, I've got a, a commentary here that uh, Sheldrake actually published uh, back in The Ecologist in March of 2005. And I'll link to this one um, in the show notes so you can go and read the full thing for yourself. Uh, but essentially, he talks about a couple of examples that he picked up over the years in relation to that that devastating tsunami. It was it was truly horrible. Um, but he points at a couple of cases. He said, "Look, um, in there was a man who was the president of the Sri Lankan uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, and he reported that in one instance, a friend was living in the south of Sri Lanka. He said he saw bats flying at great speed inland, and it was during the middle of the day. And he says they're nocturnal; they don't do this." And after moments after seeing these bats flying, he said the tsunami struck without any warning whatsoever. Another friend told him that he believed that a dog saved his life because every morning he was accustomed to taking his dogs for a run along the beach. But on the day of the tsunami, the dog would not go, refusing to leave the house. Moments later, once again, the again, tsunami struck. Um, and it was only because of his behavior that he decided not to go out. Uh, and I'll get back to, to that uh, in a second. In fact, play for me number four, please, Ben, because this is a story of a woman whose dog saved her life as well. 
There are also many examples of animals that give warnings of impending disasters to their owners. In one case, a woman was about to go out uh, to work as usual one morning, and for some reason her dog just wouldn't let her go. It kept barring the way, tried to stop her leaving the house. And uh, she left anyway, and soon afterwards was involved in a very uh, bad car crash. In another case, a woman was riding a horse and it refused to go through a gateway um, and it absolutely refused to move. And shortly afterwards, a, a branch, of, a large branch of a tree fell off, uh, which would have hit them if they'd gone ahead as she'd intended. So what is this? I mean, are, they just, are all animals just naturally psychic? Is that what's going on? Can they see through the, I don't know, the veil of time? Is that what's going on? Or yep, is that's it, a simple explanation. Yes. I don't necessarily <laughs> know that that is. I think it's that it's like a, um, it probably hasn't atrophied as much in animals as it has in people because, you know, dogs, animals, they're, they don't, they're not caught up in materialism. Mm. Where I think with us, because it's, it's a blessing and a curse of having the level of intelligence that we have and that we've overthunk everything. Like everything. Sometimes you just have to f- feel in- instead of thinking. Like, for example, can you feel it coming? Can oh, you feel gosh. it? Can you feel it? Only because I work with you for so many. Oh. <laughs> did you feel that coming? Did you feel? Did you Man, feel that? Everyone listening right now felt that coming. <laughs> Every single one of us. Did you feel that? We ban- all we knew, we all knew what Whoa. that was going to be. We all knew what did that was going to be. Feel the close up of that banana bread coming. That's a particularly. No one shocking is gonna, banana bread. No one is going to look at <laughs> banana bread the same way ever again after this show. Especially if you if you've been listening, it's a blessing. Please don't go and watch the video. That's all I do while you talk uh, about. I know your it's topics. coming. I just search for horrible I, banana breads. I, I know it's coming. <laughs> so then uh, you've got you know leading institutions as well, Oxford, Cambridge, these sorts of places that have heard these stories over the year. You know they're they're whispered in the halls of these you know uh, institutions. But it's it's something that is frowned upon, like it's something that you don't want to get involved with because it is so far from mainstream science. Well, it just so happens that there was a scientific observer who witnessed this firsthand taking place. Uh, take a listen to this one. Uh, an Oxford zoology student, a graduate student, was doing a study on the mating of toads in a lake. Enthralling. And uh, she was <laughs> documenting um, day by day how the toads came to the, the lake to mate. And then in the middle of the mating season, for several days, there were no toads. This had never been observed before. It was very surprising and puzzling. She told her supervisor at Oxford University, um, the records clearly show there were no toads. And then the, the quake struck. So here's, uh, and they didn't start mating again until several days afterwards. So here's a particularly clear cut example where there was continuous observation going on. Uh, showing uh, this change in behaviour. So a minion of the institution, and she's probably very lovely, so I shouldn't be so cruel, but you know, someone who's very much clearly indoctrinated into the realm of, of, of modern science, and to suggest something like this is occurring is absolutely absurd, and yet it was under witness. It mm-hmm. was scientifically observed taking place. I've got a photo of her right here. <laughs> oh, you <yeah>, stop! <laughs> <laughs> you should know. You should be using your presentiment powers to well, know. Well, it is. That there's my, a pumpkin my, looking. There's a vagina looking. Uh, can pumpkin. you see? I'm going red. Like I'm starting. No, it is. <laughs> it's kicking in. I can feel it. Like it's. It's really kicking in. Okay. Here's the parrot. Watch the parrot. Oh, you got the parrot. Yeah, got another six. six. Right? Yeah. A German woman called Dagmar Kessel, uh, who had a parrot. Oh, or at least her friends did. During the wartime year of 1943, I stayed with acquaintances in Leipzig. They had an old parrot. Suddenly, about 9 p.m., it was extremely upset in its cage, lifted its left wing and called Da Oben, Da Oben, up there. It even looked up and nobody could get it quiet. I was surprised and asked my host what it was all about. He always does that before an air alert, the lady said. Usually two hours in advance. That same night, the Tommies really came. They destroyed the Crystal Palace. So this parrot, two hours in advance, knew that there was going to be a bombing run by the British. How could it have known? Now, the reason why I raise this particular case, and Sheldrake does point this out, is that there are stories that come from Britain as well 
of the British right before there was going to be a raid during the Blitz that for whatever reason, dogs, birds, animals, they knew they behaved in a strange way, indicating that a bombing was about to take place. Now, look, over the years, people have said it's planes, right? They can hear the planes. It must travel far distances. They can pick it. But no, not two hours beforehand, like two hours beforehand. On top of that, it was the war. There were plenty of planes in the air all the time. So just to go, oh, well, they can hear planes and then they must have known sort of that's not. And it happens so repeatedly that it became an anecdote of people that were in the, you know, in the blitz. That so many, it happens so often that it's not just a one-off thing. It's just, it demonstrates that there's some type of effect taking place here. And this circumstance, it was a parrot. But I also picked up this very old report. It comes from LJ uh, Carbaby, who published a, uh, a story about twins, right? And twins having uh, ESP and, and strange abilities. Uh, and towards the end, though, because even though it's talking about twins, there is also these details about animals seemingly having these uh, abilities. And of course, you know, he, uh, LJ, is it LJ, I'm sorry, I got it wrong here. So, yes, LJ, LJ points out that there was a, a, a pair of students, right? And these students were um, going for an exam. And when they went for the exam, they were in the same room, but they're on opposite sides of the room. Now, they got called into the principal's office a couple of days later and were being told off because they had clearly cheated on the exam. And the reason why they thought that they cheated on the exam is because not only were their answers identical, their mistakes were identical as well. Oh, wow. And these students were like, I did. And they didn't even realize, though, that they'd actually written the same thing. Mm. There was no suggestion of them actually having any active communication telepathy between the two of them. And yet somehow they wrote the same thing and made the same mistakes. But there are other twins that have pointed out that said, well, look, and this is in this article, um, if I've got an exam coming up or I've got a book report or something like that, and I can't get through the whole thing, uh, my sister will read one half of the book, I read the other half, and we're able to do the exam. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's like they know. It's like this information just flows through. It's like, how? How is this occurring? Well, we might get into this a little bit later on when it comes back to um, this whole idea of the, the morphic family field. But uh, there's this old story, right, about uh, Padawiski's parrot. And this was a, he was a musician who became the premier of Poland. I don't know exactly what time frame we're talking about, but he had a parrot named Cocky Roberts. This is the name that he, he called it. And for whatever reason, um, he had to go away to on some business or something like that. And as he did, he entrusted the care of his uh, parrot, this Cocky Roberts, to a friend in, in Switzerland. Now, uh, for whatever reason, he was asleep in his hotel in New York, and he suddenly awoke from this dream. And I don't know what was described in the dream, but he could still hear his beloved parrot screeching, this is Cocky Roberts, let me in. Like that's the last thing he like heard. And he couldn't, well, was it in, was it in the dream or was it like, and he felt like he audibly heard it. Yeah, yeah. And so he's like, this is really for, and he just knew, he just said somehow he knew after this experience that his parrot was dead, his beloved parrot was dead. And he says, 10 days later, he, he receives this letter from his friend in Switzerland. And the letter was telling of all the, the good spirits, the excellent spirits of Cocky Roberts and his health and you know, everything's great, despite the parrot's age. And he's like, I know, but of course, you know, it's in the days where um, it takes a while for mail to get through. So that would have been posted before the dream. Yeah. So he's like, I knew another e uh, email. <laughs> I knew another letter in the mail was coming. And he says, indeed, I did receive one. He said, I received another letter afterwards where he found that uh, it was of great regret that his friend had to inform him that he had accidentally shut Cocky Roberts outside it was a very cold night oh. and the poor bird had died and been found on the doorstep the following morning, frozen to and death. And that's why he was squawking, let me in. Let me in. Isn't that- Little, I've actually heard that story before and what many people don't realise is in the dying breaths of that parrot, he it was actually like, Mark, curse Poland <laughs> to the death. Mark. And then soon after it was invaded. And actually, you, you might laugh, but Poland is actually facing a uh, parrot invasion. What? Are you <laughs> this is this is from the Science of Poland website. Scientists' invasion of parrots in Poland is only a matter of time. And there's a large green parrot. Uh, experts say that the bird is inflicting damage in agriculture and ecosystems throughout the country, and they seriously have a pest problem with parrots. So, so that's beautiful. a little known. That's a little known aspect to the story that that parrot actually but cursed the entire country of Poland. Why can't we have that here? We've got freaking cane toads that spit poison at you here. Like, and we've got them running around everywhere. They're gross and disgusting. Why can't we be invaded with parrots? I could deal with that. Well, that's why we have cane toads. Is some guy had a pet cane toad, didn't treat him right, and that cane toad <laughs> cursed, cursed the entire in our country. Harsh Australian winters. <laughs> and it's like, well, 
Now it's going to get its revenge. <laughs> so then, of course, you've got um, the paranoia that comes with some of these stories as well, of people accessing the field. And there's there's many of these stories out, right, of where people experience presentiment. Um, they have some type of knowing. Um, they'll have repeating, recurring dreams of plane crashes. And, and particularly during periods of war, um, these people get arrested because they think that they're spies. Like, how could they possibly have known that when simply they're accessing this field, but it's not recognized? Uh, and a great example of that comes from the Gestapo uh, arresting a man uh, during World War II. An Austrian sculptor, Heinz Petteri, was arrested during the war for his undiplomatic words and deported to Bochum in the Ruhr to defuse unexploded bombs. I like it that we're playing his video here and his video that you've provided is just a bad close-up of text. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I'm Why don't you about... just snip out the audio for me? Why are we watching the video? Oh, because it was like the end of the day. I'm like, we'll just put it up, it's fine. <laughs> Can I even do the audio? I think I'm... He lived in a small room in the tower of the police administration building. From his window, he used to watch the pigeons that lived on the roofs and he noticed that the birds often flew away suddenly, all of them, and half an hour later, at the most, the bombers came. Afterwards, the birds came back. This was repeated many times. He used this knowledge to warn his comrades and superiors of impending raids, and his predictions repeatedly proved to be accurate. But when the Gestapo heard about it, he was arrested once again under suspicion of being a spy in contact with the enemy. Wow. Bloody pigeons. It's always pigeons that do you in. Isn't that amazing, though? Like, somehow these birds from such a far distance were able to pick up on this. Like, there's no other way that they could have known. You know, you look at this scientifically and it's like, well, are they picking up because they can see magnetic fields, can't they? Are they possibly seeing some change in the magnetic field? No, and pigeons you know? are just psychic. <laughs> well, maybe it's the pigeon. Remember, remember that story? <laughs> the, the pigeons you've got to be careful with. So, you know, what explains this, though? It's possible that, I, and I think Rupert Sheldrake is onto something, that there is some type of, of field that uh, contains information and more so memory. Right? It contains memories of things. Um, and it's a, applicable not just to groups of, you know, particular groups of communities, families, that kind of stuff, which we'll come into in a moment, but it also can apply to entire species. And this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier in the show when you were describing the, the, the monkeys, Ben. Um, it's actually been witnessed in labs with lab rats. Just take a listen to what Rupert has to say about that. In the realm of animal behaviour, there's a well-known example of rats, a long series of experiments at Harvard, uh, Edinburgh and Melbourne University in Australia, uh, showed that when you train rats to learn a new trick, escaping from a water maze, the more rats that learned it, the easier it got for other rats to learn it, even in other parts of the world. And this wasn't just rats that were descended from trained rats who might have inherited this epigenetically, uh, but it was all rats of that breed, even ones whose parents had never been in a water maze before. Um, now, I think the same is happening in the human realm. I think it's getting easier to learn things other people have already learned. There's already lots of evidence for this. That's why you have these scientific discoveries around the world that are people that are not connected to each other coming up with the same things. It's almost like it gets put into the field, mm. and once it's in the field, it then spreads out to the rest of the species. Like a species consciousness. Yeah. Group consciousness. Yeah, which then starts tying it. You can become even more esoteric and start crossing into the realms of like um, group karma or species karma or that family karma. Like that kind of stuff starts becoming a little bit more abstract. But I'm like, maybe the ancients and people like religious scholars and that kind of thing that have seen this, like they're only describing what Sheldrake is is describing really now from a modern sense. Like we're describing it as a morphic field, but it's just something that it's already exists and in the past inherently we observed it. Yeah, and it seems that it brings to mind the the Global Consciousness Project that Absolutely. the Princeton Labs were, were still running apparently. Are they still doing that? I'm not sure about that. But you'd think, right, I mean, labs across the world, right? So there's no way these mice are somehow communicating with each other and separate. So it's not even down to people who have argued and said, oh, it's some type of genetic memory which is still crazy in itself, mm. right? Although that's becoming a little bit more acceptable these days. But no, they're not, they're not part of the same breeding program. It's almost instantaneous. It's, you know, thousands and thousands of miles distant. And yet somehow they're recognizing this. It's intriguing to think about how conscious it is. That's Especially right. Especially in humans, because with human beings, it's obviously a instinctual gut feeling mm -hmm. 
or you don't, you, you know, you're not even aware of it at all, that you're moving in a direction that your uh, fellow humans on the other side of the planet are also moving in. They're, yes. they're studying the same things, coming to the same conclusions. You, you, know, you wouldn't even be aware of it. But has that always been the case with human beings? I think so. And I've, you know, like we see what's happening in the world at the moment. And there really is, um, I mean, it's called mind virus, right? But you can see the way that people think. Like there's a distortion in people's thinking. Like people mm. are not about you know, good values of being honest and being fair and reasonable, all that kind of stuff. That's all kind of gone out. And there's just some really crazy ideas. And look, I'm not getting even political. There's just some really crazy ideas that just spread so easily now. And I've always thought up until recently that like, this is something that is uh, to do with social media. Social media is responsible for it. It's, you know, other people see it. Well, it, it is, like, but it's not the only. But it's thought. not exactly. That's what I'm, I'm thinking. It's not just social media. There's something etheric going on. It's not even etheric, but there's something that's undiscovered, which is like this feel. And this kind of explains it. I wonder if, and he does point out. Like right? traditionally, you'd say there's something in the water, but it's not even that. No, there's something, there's in, something the field. in the field. Yeah, there's yeah. something. And this is why it can, because why is it that these absurd harebrained ideas that are, you know, at, at an obscure university in the US suddenly are flourishing in Australia? It's like, and it's like, it's, it's so taken on so rapidly and so easily. If it's in, if it's in the morphic fields, could you have a, a hermit? You've got some guy, he's just out in the woods somewhere. He has no contact with human beings, right? He's been living out there for years and he just meditates all day. But then one day he just opens his eyes and he's like, I'm a woman. <laughs> Is that how the morphic fields would work? Well, I'm... I'm not entirely sure. I think there has to be other factors going on. Like you have to have the influence. But in saying that, possibly his thinking might be altered, like into a, into a certain direction. He may be influenced. And I'm not going all the Starts way to say that. Starts wearing a grass skirt. Well, first. I mean, I'm not saying all of a sudden he opens his eyes and he's Dylan Mulvaney. But still, like it's like this. I think this could explain why groups behave in this. Because a really great example by Sheldrake is pointed out by termite mounds, which I might play a little bit later on. But he, he goes into the idea that termites that are blind are able to build these intricate, incredible mounds. And they replicate them over and over again. He's like, how are they able to do it? It's because they're following the field. And he says it comes down to these two warring things, as I pointed out, which is habit, and then you've got creativity. So habit is like, this is why people look the way we do. And we're only recently talking about um, physiognomy and you know how the stars can influence how people... This is all to do possibly with the fields, right? Because we've seen... And I'll play the audio, actually. Play number nine for me, because he actually describes this um, far better than I can. It's clear in, in biology that there was a major problem called the missing heritability problem. That um, you could, if you knew all the genes of a person, you could predict the likelihood of breast cancer or schizophrenia or something like that with an accuracy of less than 10%. With schizophrenia, it's about 3%. Um, uh, even for height, which is a fairly obvious physical characteristic, yeah, can't find you, you can only explain about 10% in terms of genes. Um, so what's, where's all the rest of the inheritance coming from? And this is called within biology the missing heritability problem. I remember reading about that with the Chinese efforts to engineer height and find genetic links to those really? kind of attributes. But you would think a, a, something like height would be fairly simple, but no, nope. there's no chance of finding it. Like the odds of finding whatever turns that on is so obscure and it's like needle in a haystack well, doesn't even begin to describe it finding the, that combination of genetic information. Which is just crazy when you think about it because he was, he, he didn't include, well, I didn't include in the audio there, but he was talking about the Human Genome Project. And it really was kind of this, this belief that ultimately once we've mapped the entire ge human genome, we'll know everything. Like full Everything. Gattaca future, Gattaca future designer exactly. babies, yeah. No. Nope. Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's just, and it's, not go it's never going to happen. No. It's never going to happen, which is really quite fascinating, especially with these transhumanists and these, these terrible people that are pushing these, these concepts. Um, their dreams are never going to happen. But because they're so caught up in materialism, they can't understand that it's never going to happen. Um, but it almost like, it almost crosses into the realms of eugenics. Like, it's a modern form of eugenics. It's actually yeah, quite... Of course it is. It's, it's horrible. Maybe. Like it, It's truly horrible. Um, but in a way, I feel I find comfort in it that we can't. I mean, it's like we're not we're not supposed to understand that. You know, I, I don't know why. I just feel like I don't think eugenics is horrible. I just think forced eugenics is horrible. Of course, yeah. like if you if you as you know have certain attributes and you want to find a mate mate that has attributes sure, that yeah. you appreciate and want yeah. to pass on to your children, that's not horrible. That's fine. That's, yeah, of course, that's admirable. Yeah, but it, it's obviously if it's forced on you. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, like Gattaca. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And then the entirety of society then conforms to what genes you have as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, what's your character. It's really a horrible thing. Um, but I, I thought about this as I was, I was listening to his audio and I was like, well, what's the answer? Like, what's happening here? And essentially, and I'll link to this particular video because it's quite a long presentation. It's about a 40 to 50 minute presentation. Um, but he quite expertly, and rightly so, explains how these morphic fields possibly can describe and, and explain why you have this kind of trait of why a person looks the way they look. It's about the field. But then it's really fascinating. He says, in fact, go down and play number 15. Just before we okay. play 15. Yep, there you go. Oh, no, not that. Oh, sorry. Just before Wrong we play button. This, this video. I right? accidentally put up the vagina bread again. So when you're talking about morphic fields influencing form, right, and influ- influencing the, the, the reality we live in, it doesn't work for long habituations. So the structure and behavior of the hydrogen atom, for example, right, that's been going for 13 billion years or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we cannot influence. That we cannot change. But new and novel things, and this is where it crosses in from, you know, habit to creativity, new and novel things, you can actually see this. You can see changes taking place. And he says a really great example is in the uh, formation of chemical crystals. Oh, okay. So when you're trying to synthesize new chemical crystals, uh, they behave in very strange fashion. Just play it for me, Ben. According to morphic resonance, the first time you make the crystal, um, it may take a long time for the new crystal form to come into being. And when you make it repeatedly over and over again in labs all around the world, a habit, new habit builds up and the crystal should form, crystallize more easily. And that's exactly what chemists find. Crystals get easier and easier to crystallize. But of course, they don't explain it in terms of morphic resonance. They explain it in terms of, firstly, anecdotes about chemists carrying seeds or nuclei, little bits of previous crystals around the world on their beards or clothing. And what? Or secondly, in terms of dust particles from previous crystals being wafted around the world in the atmosphere. Um, How absurd. Is that this should happen even when bearded chemists are excluded <laughs> and when the dust is filtered from the atmosphere. And, um, and also, this theory predicts the melting points of crystals, which are called physical constants, should go up as time goes on because the crystals get more stable through morphic resonance. The form becomes more habitual and therefore it should be harder to break the form down. You'd need a higher temperature to do it. And actually, the melting points of new compounds do go up, sometimes by 10, 20 degrees. I've studied this with hundreds of chemicals. And most chemists simply, uh, they have to acknowledge the fact that this is happening, even though these are supposed to be physical constants. Um, but they say, oh, well, it's just because we get better at making the crystals and, and, and they're purer samples and purer samples have higher melting points. That, but it's incredibly difficult to get them to test this hypothesis. And it's, I mean, it's already been tested through everyday practice of chemistry, but um, the facts fit very well with morphic resonance. Isn't it almost absurd, though? Like, you can hear the, the excuses that you've got people that are like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing scientists. You've got people that work very hard and they're trying to find explanations and trying to theorize as to why things are happening. But then they come up with truly absurd explanations like, oh, you know, a, a fraction of the crystal got caught in some dude's beard. And then when it landed in another, like, could you imagine the things like that we talk about coincidence, right? It's like Jungian level coincidence that would have to take place. For that to happen in same, the same labs all around the world, and much like the other science scientific discoveries we we're talking about before, it's the same thing. Mm. You, you find this new compound that you crystallize, all of a sudden it starts happening faster because this is the habit, right? The more that it gets built, the more like it manifests in our reality in a habitual fashion. So that's why you can test this kind of stuff. So once it becomes even more readily established, it's much easier for it to manifest in our reality. So it's like these ideas, these new hypotheses, these discoveries, they manifest in our reality and it becomes mm. easier and easier and easier for it well, to Well, you occur. get the feeling that Sheldrake will be looked upon by f- future generations. Oh, he'll as, be like Copernicus. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking of Copernicus, a, an absolute visionary for the time, but just, I guess, held back by the the old ways of thinking and the status quo yes. and the politics. I, I, I think he's a remarkable man in the things that he's describing. Um, but then he crosses into, like, we were talking about genes there before, let's, let's jump back, because he was talking about genes. And of course, twins come up. And I, and I highlighted that, that you know, morphic fields might be able to explain you know, what's occurring here because you pick it up in twins. And just, just play what he says about twins for me, Ben. As all of you know, there used to be um, 
a lot of studies, and there still are, of identical twins separated soon after birth in order to find out how much of human nature depends on genetics and on the environment. And it turns out that identical twins separated soon after birth have a huge number of features in common, not just their physical appearance, but in the Minnesota twin studies involving thousands of pairs of twins, um, uh, ridiculously detailed things like painting their houses the same colour, calling their kids by the same names. Not the kinds of things even the most ardent neo-Darwinian would expect to be in, encoded in the genes. Well, if morphic resonance is taking place, the very fact that they're identical, or at least very similar, means they'd specifically resonate with each other across space and time, even if they're living in separate places um, and in separate families, and there'd be a great deal of uh, connection between them and similarity. So what this evidence may suggest is uh, that morphic resonance is going on rather than it's all due to the gene. Is there like twin criminals who have been separated at birth and then get arrested for the same crimes. I'm glad you asked that, yeah, I just, that popped I'm into my head. I'm actually glad you asked Is that. Is there a case of that? Because there was. Let me just have a look here. There was some research, and we're going back to the Carberry uh, article. Where is it? Um, there was studies that were con conducted, I believe, in Helsinki, perhaps, or um, where is it here? I'll just have a look. Because it, it was, in fact, there was, oh, this is what it was. It was comparison between... And something elaborate, like it was some really elaborate bank robbery or they were both jewel thieves it, <laughs> or something. <laughs> well, you know what? It's funny because it doesn't go into that level of detail, but what it does highlight is uh, their criminal activity. And where is it? I'm just trying to find the exact source. From what I recall off the top of my head, it was comparing the difference between um, paternal twins and fraternal twins, or identical twins, sorry, and fraternal twins. So identical twins, it's the same ovum which has been duplicated, and then for um, you know the, the other kind of twins, it's just um, both eggs have been yeah. fertilized, right? So there was this study that was conducted into criminality in twins. When you look at identical twins, right, there was it was uh, I think it was seventeen uh, sets of identical twins that were looked at. Thirteen of them have been involved in criminal activities. Like 13 sets of twins have right. been involved in criminal activities. That's a high number. It's a high number, right? So <laughs> twins are, twins are identical cr twins, right? There's just something right, right there. Um, but these identical twins that had also been, it was found, even when, this is a, the reason why it was such a small study, because I have to point out they were separated at birth as well. That's the other important part. They mm. were So they weren't like they were brothers or yeah, sisters yeah, yeah. hanging around and getting into bad groups. Completely separated. But when they were looked at in the study, 13 out of those 17 groups had participated in some type of crime and it was the same crime. It was the same crimes, like jewel thieves or, you know, a certain type jewel of violence thieves. or something like that, right? <laughs> but when they looked at fraternal twins, they did, uh, I think they only got 13 cases of this, right? One. One pair of them were criminals. The rest of them weren't. And in that second, they were different criminals. I've never trusted twins. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is something weird going. And in fact, to highlight that even further, right, because of what, what Sheldrake was describing there, also in the article by Carberry, he uh, talks about the, the twins Sylvia and Goldie. And uh, Sylvia was at home one day when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, right, she just she's just sitting in the lounge, right? She's just sitting in the lounge. She's just folded laundry. She's just relaxing. She's got, you know, the afternoon TV on. She's like, Goldie, take it right! It just screams it out. And she mm -hmm. stops. She's like, where did that come from? That's that's really strange. Just so happens that um, Goldie had been out all afternoon and Sylvia was feeling really uncomfortable at this. She had this anxiety over what had happened to her sister, who was an identical twin. She'd left home to go do some shopping. Now, as she's trying to watch TV to overcome these feelings of apprehension, um, she has this flash in her head, right, when she's screaming it out. She says she sees like these two lights heading straight towards her and that was it, right? Now, fortunately, uh, her twin sister, uh, Goldie, comes home and Goldie is clearly white as a sheet and she's been traumatized by something. And she's like, oh my God, you know, I... and before she can even say anything, Sylvia's like, a truck almost smashed into you, didn't it? And Goldie's like, yeah, yeah, dear, I turned and this truck just suddenly almost like was bearing down on me. And for whatever reason, I heard you scream at me audibly, turn to your right, because I didn't know which direction to go. Oh, she saved a life, did and she? And had she gone to the left, she would have hit the truck head on. She went to the right, saved a life. So that's not just simply telepathy. Like She audibly heard her screaming at her, and somehow the other twin just even had the mm. presentence. That's the to kind of connection you can't have with the parrot. Yeah. <laughs> well, you don't know. You don't know. The parrot, like we know with this one, that the parrot was stuck outside freezing. 
<laughs> there was a connection there. You <laughs> can funny. have a connection with the parrot. <laughs> so then it all comes down to, right, so this is where we, we get to the whole the field memory thing. Um, and I, I went into this because I thought it was going to like give me some understanding as to why it is that my son was picking up on these things. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, it's more to do with what, what Sheldrake is describing. Uh, some study that was conducted in to, regards to, it's a therapy called uh, family constellation, like family constellation therapy. And uh, his wife has, has conducted this, but it relates to morphic fields, right? So if you play number 11, it just sets up the scene for where we're going to go with this. Where this affects us is that um, families are social groups and families have a kind of memory in the family field. And when we um, start new families, when people get married or live together and have children and start a new family, um, both the parents uh, have family fields. They bring with them a field from their family of origin. And the family is a kind of hybrid between these two family fields. So he's describing this family field that you bring together, right? So this is, again, this habit first creation. And you've got like this long history within your family that you've come from. And then all of a sudden you create a new family. So it creates this new kind of space where these things can come through. It's almost like some type of, um, it's a genetic history, but it's not genetic at all. It's a, it's a history of your family, which controls the traits of what goes on inside the dynamics of your family. And he points out that this is like why you've got uh, black sheep, because it comes down to these family field patterns. Like you've always had a family member that might behave in a certain way or act out in a certain way. That might be the case because they've previously acted that way in the past. Yeah, it's so interesting because it completely overlaps with the concept of karma and ancestral karma. Does it? Yeah. And even uh, Western, you know, very esoteric Western researchers who claim to have psychic abilities can actually perceive these karmic connections. And we've covered a couple of individuals in the past who mm. have called called these chords. They see these chords of connections between the families that are formed. Um, but yeah, in, even in terms of the, I guess, Eastern concept of family virtue and yes. family honor, there's uh, something that goes beyond the surface level understanding of, well, you have a reputation and you, you, you know, you're concerned about how your family is viewed by others and the status of your family. There's something that goes beyond that into an actual tangible, like Sheldrake would call it a field. You might call it uh, virtue, but it's it's something that's actually a, a real tangible thing. Yes. It's not just an idea. It's not just a concept. And it carries on with the individual and indeed the family group. And then, it, of course, you can expand that concept on to uh, even wider groups like people, Communities nations, and, yeah. races, whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, this is what he was describing more in the sense of uh, family dynamics and patterns. But you're right, I can see where it would cross into that that kind of area of you know things taking place. But this was more like... That, there's that old saying of the sins of the father. Mm. You know, it's the same kind of thing. It's like, well, it's like it could be to do with, you know, there's an old saying of nature versus nurture, which is one of the headlines, but really it's nature versus nature, sorry, nature versus nurture versus the family morphic field. And sometimes that morphic field can be so powerful that it overpowers. And that's exactly what happened in some of the studies that he's done. Play number 12 for me, please, Ben. And the kind of work that happens in family constellation therapy um, depends very much on these family fields. And I know more about this than some because Jill has been practicing this for many years, my wife Jill Purse, who's here, and has, uh, through her work and through the work of others, it becomes clear that the people's behavior is shaped by the family field, often by unconscious habitual patterns from previous generations, of which people are often completely unaware. And individuals within those families may behave in ways that individual psychotherapy can't really deal with. Because, for example, if in previous generations someone's been excluded from the family because they've committed suicide, committed a crime, done something shameful, or what, for whatever reason they've been excluded, then in a later generation one member of the family may unconsciously identify with the excluded person and exclude themselves by behaving in a dysfunctional way or becoming suicidal. Um, and individual psychotherapy just can't get to the bottom of this because it's not an individual problem. It's to do with something that's within the habitual field of the family. Because they don't recognise it. They don't recognise it, so there's no way to treat it conventionally. 
So it's like, you know, I've spoken to, to therapists over the years who have described these things like uh, families living or speaking the language of abuse, right? That's one thing that comes up. And if you've you know, grown up with a narcissist and there's, there's more out there than you realize, but people, if they've grown up in these certain households, or they have these certain patterns. And it's like, if you actually look into it, there's like a family history of this kind of stuff. Now, people would say, well, that's a result of genetics, like there's some genetic, but we can't use genetics to determine that. Like it's just, it doesn't fit, right? So what's the explanation for it? It could be that it's these habitual patterns that form. And there's that thing that you see, of, of course, of many people that have escaped these certain situations where they describe like, it stops with me. Like that's kind of a cliche saying, but you know, people make the choice to, to change that. And that's where we go from habit to creativity. It's like where the, the field changes and you actually can change the field like to cause you to have a better family life. But one thing that came out of this, which again, highlights the high strangeness associated with this stuff is that in there's, there's certain practices that can be done. These, um, these, I guess, unconventional therapeutic practices to solve these morphic issues with families. And uh, he points out that during COVID, uh, obviously there was lockdown, so people couldn't go to these sessions. But when they were conducting these sessions over Zoom, they were still having the same effect. And of course that makes sense, right? Because it's spooky action at a distance. You don't have to be right there. But what was really weird is that when we've come back now and all these lockdowns and these silly things have finished and we've, we've gone back to a relatively normal society, um, he pointed out that there's sometimes when you go to a session, and obviously you're not going to bring your crazy family members along. It's about treating you. You have someone stand in. It's like someone will stand in and will um, take on the role of the parent or whoever you're having the issue with, right? They do some very strange, unexpected things. Well, I'm just looking at some of the photos of the uh, family constellation. Oh, really? Well, look at this, right? So this is where they put people in. I don't know what's going on. It looks like on. a bit of uh, Tibetan tantra. <laughs> it's very orange. Like that guy it's very in the front about to get pegged by his cousin <laughs> in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the point I'm trying to make. Just to play for me. Number 13, please. There are representatives for different members of the family selected from the group and those representatives someone who's standing in for the mother the father the brother the sister and so on often speak uh, when they're asked how they feel um, often speak in a very appropriate way uh, about the, their situation in that family field even though they don't know any very much about the family at all and they, they it somehow comes through them as if they channel it from the field so you've got a independent person mm. who is this they're representing that family member that the person is getting therapy about and they start behaving in that fashion almost like they're channeling like what are they they're picking up on the field it's almost i mean it's obviously it's not proof but it's a strong suggestion that there is some type of psychic field morphic field this memory field that sits there that is influencing us in our daily lives so i'm not saying it absolves us of responsibility but it does give us some greater insight into what could be beyond this reality that we see. Like we see it very much in a materialistic way, but there are these hidden forces that are directing what's going on right down to our family dynamics. Well, again, it's the kind of thing that makes you wish people like Sheldrake were taken more seriously Absolutely. by the status quo. And, you know, he could sidestep all the scientific dogma because the implications of it <laughs> are pretty yeah. far reaching. Like it's a pretty fundamental change to how we view reality in our relationships with each other. Yeah. I, I hope that one day it does become, you know, readily accepted. But I just think that it's it's a long time. And look at Copernicus. I mean, how many hundreds of years ago did he die? Look at him. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to get out of the show. We're going to get out of this part of the show. I do apologize. It's like, don't blame his that's actions. One, don't blame me for his actions. One too many vagina breads for that's, Aaron. That's too much for me. I, I'm good now. So uh, that's the end of the show for regular listeners. But I'll, of course, I'll link to go and check out his channel because he's got a whole heap of great videos in there talking about some really fascinating things. Uh, of course, I'll link to his books and I'll also link to the uh, the articles that we've discussed in the show notes at mysteriousuniverse.org. Yeah, cool. Coming up after the break for our plus extension, Means of Control. Troll by Byron Tao, how the hidden alliance of tech and government is creating a new American surveillance state. Is your profile on some NSA server just banana bread now? All of us have a profile. Of course we do. Mine would be like a random string of numbers, then banana bread. <laughs> and yeah, this is this makes what Snowden revealed in 2013 look like 
a obsolete piece of technology. It almost, it because I don't believe this, but it almost makes me wonder, did they deliberately do the Snowden thing to d- distract us from what's really going on in the background? Oh, no, they were, they were pretty pissed off about Snowden. Yeah, like, yeah. That's, they were genuinely pissed off. Yeah, well, the fact that he had to flee to Russia or wherever he went that has never yeah. returned. And it did, it did really spoil a lot of the NSA's advantage that America had over their foreign adversaries. Uh, and they kind of had to take a step back, and that's what this new system is all about. Uh, But it it really is a much more powerful weapon. I've got some incredible stuff coming up, details about how your uh, tire pressure monitoring system can be easily read by the defense industry and the intelligence agencies, and it's used to track you. So if I get scudded on the way home, we know why. Yeah, like you t- just the tire pressure. Because the most modern cars tell you your tire pressure. Yeah, you don't positive. have to yeah. go and check it on some device. It just sends a signal. That signal can be intercepted. And there's even private companies setting up surveillance equipment all around the United States, like on public you know, telephone poles and um, you what, know, like, street lamps. Like that, signal towers. Yes, that are picking up the signals sent by your tire pressure monitoring system. That's that nuts. data is then aggregated and sold to insurance companies some spurious clients let's just say that because i saw an article this week and i'll have to see if i can find it and put it in the show notes of people getting pissed off because major car manufacturers have just you know basically been exposed for taking uh, people's insurance premiums were going up and they couldn't work out why. It was because the car manufacturer was sending data of people's cars, like how rapidly they braked, how rapidly they accelerated, if they did a sharp turn. All that information was being sent to the insurer. Like, how ridiculous. (laughs) I drive like a maniac. I haven't had one accident. Well, it goes even further than that to the point where, for example, Nissan, in its terms and conditions fully states that it can detect your sexual orientation (laughs) from your vehicle data. I'm not even joking. What? I am not even joking. What, from the music that you listen to? like All sorts of stuff, man. Wait till you hear this. It's coming up in plus. Head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today and get access to these big extensions we do every single Friday. And of course, if you sign up for plus, you get our exclusive shows that come out on Tuesday as well. You're getting more than double the content when you sign up for Plus. All the details are at mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash Plus. Plus members also get a higher quality audio version of the show, a totally ad-free version of the show as well. And if you sign up for MU Max, you get access to our entire back catalogue, 16, 17 plus years of shows going back to the creation of the earth. That's how old it is. Just so many. No, that's that's ridiculous. <laughs> it was right after the flood. Okay, yeah, right. the flood ended, the water went down, you and I got, <laughs> we walked off Noah's Ark and we got started. Oh, there's a couple of post or pre-Diluvian episodes in there. <laughs> there actually is. <laughs> there's a couple of pre-Diluvians. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. There are. Sign up today, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus, help support your favorite show. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Some seriously spooky surveillance uh, CIA stuff coming up after the break. Stick around for that if you're on Plus for everyone else. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week. Thank <laughs> you.